It's Wednesday, off and on the clock. Pete Overzet in the Badge Bros. We are going to hop in a big board draft on Underdog Fantasy. Can we take down the tournament for $200,000? We've been grinding men in their underwear, watching it in slow-mo. We are ready to dissect every single combine performance from top to bottom. It's Nez, it's John, it's Pete. Let's go. All right. Oh, look at this. The, the reason we're late is because uh, Nez was reading Billy Walters to us. He had an entire chapter that he thought we should all hear him read. How, how are you enjoying the book, Nez? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, I muted myself because I like to read out loud. Uh, no, I was <laughs> just, uh, <laughs> you know, just doing, doing some light reading here. I'm a big time reader now. Uh, very fun book. Very, uh, very excited to get into it. I'm only like a few chapters in, but it's uh, it's a very good read. But I a uh, little Easter egg there just because, you know, the big it was you, you mentioned this on your newsletter, big highlight of how Billy just like grind, gr like grinded so many different edges to, to make his money and kind of see some parallels there with the uh, with the combine. I mean, I'm not the one that's going to be uh, extracting those edges, but <sighs> I'm going to be listening to smart people that, that do extract them. I do think there are, you know, I mentioned in that piece about how there's so little information asymmetry now that like if you just uncover a nugget it's probably going to be widely disseminated but i don't necessarily think that's always the case like a good example would be uh in underdog had um combine 40 times up right if you were in did they have those mm -hmm. yeah i mean that was something too where if you were grinding that stuff and kind of accumulating your own data from various other sources you could have probably built up and i know people did a pretty good card there of just like no one has aggregated this in one single place but if you go and do it on your own then you have an edge in that stuff and it's like those are the things right they're the markets that aren't widely you know bet on like if you go to try to bet the nfl draft stuff like that's gonna be pretty efficient everyone's hawking that but you start doing like offensive mm -hmm. linemen broad jump times or you know <laughs> heights like then you're gonna maybe venture into territory where people aren't you know fishing around as much that's that's actually a pretty good parallel to what we saw happen on underdog this week is we saw we saw the new bar at the top there that suggests that they're going to be offering some new sports mma mm. tennis like that sort of stuff so i mean if we're all working off the same nba projections the same nfl projections aggregating all the same sources well maybe the next uh, loophole edge on underdog is we get in those uh atp tennis streets nest <laughs> i'm gonna have to grind grind some athletic articles see who's who's up and coming all i know is uh uh alcantara uh that the, the young uh that that spanish kid that's just like the next the already next ahead thing. of me that's all i know he's he's 101 <laughs> i'm good there and this is this i think i talked about this last year and even when we talk about which sites to play on or in, in that stuff right or with this it's like there is uh a, an element of wanting to just have the comfort food of drafting. You know where you're drafting, you're familiar with the sport, it's fun, it's enjoyable. It can even be mindless at times. Like that can actually be a selling point to it and that you're not have to be hyper engaged knowing every single little thing. And yet the more drafting or whatever kind of, you know, speculation you're doing, other people feel like that, there's probably less edges because there's so many people there feeling the same way. It's like, you do have to be willing to roll up your sleeves, go places other people don't want to do, look for edges, look places other people don't want to look. Or in the case of Billy Walters, hire a team to go through the plains in Las Vegas and find various uh, newspapers from around the country to get your local news. That's Loki so sharp. I love for that era. era like that's so sharp I, I i've been doing a audiobook because I'm not that smart guys i like to listen to it while i walk and stuff opposed to sit down and read for a long time but yeah that's that story hit home for sure are you gonna tell people say, that you read the book no i'm not that guy okay i i know I, I i just told that's you that stolen I'm valor. To it. yeah like, i'm not i'm not a i'm not a like a hey i read that guy i okay. uh uh, well, one thing that's interesting about the Billy Walters auto audio, audio book, uh, audio book, I read it, but I heard he narrates it. That's right, John. Yeah. And but he was not all of it. Like, oh, for what? The, okay. Well, the one that I'm listening to right now, there's been like two voices. So, I mean, I'm only three or four chapters in, but it's been two voices. 
it's funny you say that because I think he mentioned on his Rogan interview that he was like, you know, most people in his spot don't do the audiobook themselves, but you know, Billy Walters being Billy Walters, he's like, I'm going to narrate this goddamn thing. He said <laughs> it was very fun and effortless to do the stuff where it was his voice, the things he wrote. But if he was like relaying a story or, you know, maybe using like talking about court transcripts or whatever and using language, he wouldn't say, he said, those parts took him like a hundred times longer than just the stuff he wrote where he was tripping up on lines, having to do it over and over again, where if he's just reading his own thoughts, he was like, Oh, this is easy. So a, a peek behind the curtain of recording your own audio. Book. There you go. Um, um, yeah. Take us away, John. Well, I see when you were a little behind schedule there, I was, I was filibustering Pete for, for an intro for us today to go with. <laughs> and every, everywhere you, uh, you look, everyone's going to be talking, uh, Xavier worthy. And they're going to be talking, you know, who, who's been pushing up the boards and stuff. I got to take Blake Corum, Anaya Smith stole the combine, the bench press leaders, the bench press ages better than any 40 time ever will because they will be aesthetically pleasing for the remainder of their life because they can toss that weight around. So shout out to those two. No one's talking about them winning the bench press at their given position. What, what did, uh, what did Corin put up? How many times at 225? 27. Wasn't my guy Dylan Loeb not too far behind. Did someone tell me he was yeah, at like 23 or 24 or something? Yeah, I think so. I think everybody was split apart by one and he was like fourth, I think third or fourth. Dude. Yeah. I mean, there, the bench press is still like, it, it's the one that people have probably the most um, understanding of what it means. Right. Like, cause even, yeah. even with a 40 yard dash, it's like anyone can go time the 40 or whatever, but it's like, everyone has lifted some weights. They've tried to do the bench. They know what I put two 45s on that's 135. And then you're like, wait, these guys are putting on another set of 45s and then doing it 26 <laughs> times. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think it's funny because, like, what are like NFL executives like? Are they actually putting any weight on on the bench press? Like, <laughs> seriously, are you yeah. actually like docking a guy points in draft capital because of of bench press reps? It's just, it's just. Well, me up, man. What do you think it matters most for? Like the lines, right? It has to be like an O line, D line for those rating. guys. Yeah, yeah, and even and even then, that's so much of like their ass, you know. Like, yeah, like you got to do swim moves and stuff, but like that's all in the all in the hips, baby. <laughs> it isn't like if you think about and you see a lot of the drills that the linemen do. You know, there is a lot of like that immediate like push off stuff. So I mean, that's the exact same bench. So maybe we all just see the predictive analytics for stuff as it pertains to skill position players we're like, we know that the 40 is more important for a running back, not as big of a deal for wide receivers or whatever. Maybe, maybe there are some analytics out there that us fantasy bros haven't stumbled upon that a 40 act or a bench press actually correlates for future uh, yeah, like, offensive lineman success. You go to like the, the relative athletic score or something like that. And it's just so heavily weighted to the bench press for like four or five possession yeah. positions that we just don't <laughs> care about. It, it's it's really it is kind of fascinating to think and i know there's been a lot of talk with this specific combine about you know is the combine broken and that these guys are now specifically training for these mm. events and optimizing for spe specific events like if you were a pass catcher running back or whatever and you're like okay i'm just gonna say screw the 40 i'm just gonna try to nail these agility drills or whatever because that's what those guys are looking for in this type of archetype or whatever and you see these guys have really good scores i think that's kind of a an interesting angle as far as like it what makes it impressive to me is these guys ultimately do need to be well-rounded athletes and if you talk I, i've been following this like fitness influencer guy and he's like a marathon runner and like a bodybuilder and he gets crap from both communities they're like you could be so much stronger <laughs> if you didn't run and they're like you could be so much faster if you didn't lift he's like no fucking shit <laughs> but I just like to do both. And so I am like not optimizing for one specific thing. So it is interesting, like the guys that are really well-rounded, that's kind of impressive to me because it shows more that you aren't just like optimizing for a specific drill. So when like Xavier Worthy crushes the jumps and like the 40 yard dash, like that's more interesting to me of just like, oh, this guy ran a blazing fast 40 and then couldn't do jack shit anywhere else. Yeah, that's a pretty good shout. I mean, I like it too 
I mean, even straying away from football, looking at like guys who played multiple sports and stuff, because, you know, there's so much crossover because like guys are just like good athletes, you know, be the, the running joke of like, oh, he played basketball in college and blah, blah, blah. It's like that low key kind of matters. No, like just like little stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I think the well I think the the take right is these days the if you I bet if you asked most football players you know if they could choose which sport to make their you know profession in they would choose basketball but it requires a level of coordination that I think a lot of them then get funneled to football where athleticism specifically in high school and, and then definitely maybe to a lesser extent college, it's like athleticism can just win out period. Like if you're faster mm-hmm. than the other dude, like GG, whereas basketball, like you have to have that skill element. So when these guys do play a sport at an elite level, in addition to football, like, yeah, I think that means something because it shows that their coordination is on a, a different playing field, unless it's lacrosse, in which case it did nothing for Chris Hogan in the NFL. <laughs> sp- sp- well, me- oh, ahead, John. no lacrosse means your nails though because like lacrosse <laughs> is a big lacrosse yeah. is a big second sport here but it's not field lacrosse it's uh box lacrosse and it's literally just like mma and shoulder pads <laughs> with, there's with a, a different version of canadian lacrosse oh yeah dude it's like I played on the this. exact okay so so when the ice comes out, because they got to like, you know, repaint and that sort of stuff in the summertime, there's like this two month window of like crossover sport here where, you know, 50% of the ice is gone. So you can't play summer hockey. So guys play box lacrosse. And it's literally like you just, you wear your hockey gear, but you just change it out for the lacrosse stick. And it's like, anything goes like you can just whack guys. You can cross check guys. Like <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bloodbath. I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, it's a bloodbath, man. It's like the kids that played lacrosse and then went on to play like professional lacrosse. Like here. Yeah. Yeah. Here you go. Colorado mammoth, like NLL. Like I got a buddy who's a, fu- who's a firefighter who plays on one of my hockey teams who was drafted by that team. And they the have drafts. <laughs> oh yeah, dude. Yeah. There's like a professional league. Yeah. Anyways. That's wild. hilarious, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of the most violent sports you could see. Yeah, I was just gonna say in, in talks of like the uh, being in high school and you know deciding your your fate if you have the ability to go D one or whatever. But do you think that there is a trend, or is this just like a little bit of just like an outlier of an awesome wide receiver class, or is there a trend of uh, like talented players before they get to college, like? not wanting to be running backs and like, Hey, I, if I'm playing skill position, I need to be a wide receiver because like the writing has been on the wall for years. Do you think that there's act, is there any sort of like correlation causation to that based on like what we've seen? Because right now this wide receiver draft class looks like historic. I think there has to be right. Like imagine right now, if say you were like one of those like helicopter parents and you had this like prodigious young, like eighth grade talent or whatever at football, and you're sitting here looking at how the contracts play out for these running backs, where it's like, none of these guys are getting franchise tagged. Like they're all going to get way less on the market than they want. You look at the injury rates, all of the data. And then on top of that, you see how the league is going. It's like, Holy cow. Tank, Tank Dell came into the league weighing like 150 pounds soaking wet. And now he's like a superstar because a lot of the rules have made it easier for those wide receivers to succeed. You're not having to get as physical as they used to all of that stuff. NFL teams are more willing to draft smaller guys. And you're like, yeah, guess what kiddo? You're not playing fullback anymore in eighth grade. You are now a a slot wide receiver. Like I, and I assume that's a slow trickle down, but don't you think like, we're just going to keep seeing more and more of that. Cause my thesis is like the NFL is going to turn more into and cover your ears, you know, uh, Uh, old school football fans. Like it's going to turn into flag football in the long run. So like that is naturally going to skew more pass catchers, more speed. Like that is what is going to be in vogue in the NFL in the future. Well, Mm -hmm. they're low key taking a step and already doing that by uh, adding it to the Olympics with flag football, like seven aside flag football. Yeah. For the, for the ones in Los Angeles there. So, I mean, yeah, obviously, but I I do think you guys are really onto something there where like, we're going to see that like the best athlete on the, on the field, you know, 10 years ago used to be at the running back position. Now the best athletes on the field are no, are no longer. Right. And it's just like, Hey, we need three rotating guys who can be serviceable. 
And I think I think maybe this is one of the first years. I, I don't know. Maybe we're going too far with it, and maybe it's just a bad running back class. But this is one of the first <laughs> like classes where you look at it and you're like, oh yeah, wow. Like there's nine, ten wide receivers that you want before any running back. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I mean, I assume college has been moving that way as well, right? Like more of the pro style spread it out offenses, less of like the, the army style Navy football, where it's just like running 98% of, of the time. <laughs> yeah. Bone, little T offenses. Yeah. Yeah. And even like, I, again, I don't know, it's, it's still just a single sample size, but like there aren't like a ton of like really big backs in this class. Um, and the, and the one, and the one that people wanted to get excited about the kid from Notre Dame ran the slowest 40 at the four, eight, whatever. So it was like, that was the bruiser that people wanted to get excited about. Um, blanking on his name right now. Yeah. Esteem. Esteem. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And he, he, he's, he's like two forty, prototypical, like, Hey, this could be your, your bruiser at the goal line guy. And he just runs a brutal 40 and it's like, Oh, maybe he's an undrafted free agent now. <laughs> Well, and that was like, like, look at a guy like Deontay Foreman, right? You know, was very good behind Derrick Henry in Tennessee, was good in Carolina um, when he got opportunities and like, didn't really like when you looked at his metrics from last year, like didn't lose that big of a step was still fine. And he was like the third running back on a bad team, like that kind of prototype, I guess, unless you are a unicorn like Derrick Henry, where there's just such a buy-in like culturally of like, this guy gets better when he gets his 30th carry. Like outside of that, I mean, that that is kind of a dying breed. Do you, do you guys think we'll see the combine go kind of similar to the way of the bowl games now? That if guys don't make like the, the playoff, they sit out because the draft's so important. Do you think that we'll see a combine where the only guys competing are fringe guys? Because like, you know, we didn't get Marvin Harrison Jr. and we didn't get neighbors this year. One of them's like, you know, nursing injury, that sort of thing. But, you know, we didn't get any quarterbacks. They're all going to just throw at their own pro days and that sort of stuff. Like, do you guys think that's going to be the trend of the future that the guys that need to prove it, prove it? And the rest of them are just kind of like, eh, all right, I'm going to get drafted anyways. Yeah, that's that's it's interesting. I mean, I. I... I, I could see it, but I still think we're going to like, I don't think it's going to be like, Oh, no first rounders are doing the combine anymore. I think that there's still some guys that feel like they have something to prove that, you know, that they have not, you know, everything to gain based on like what they know about themselves and be like, Oh yeah. Like I'm a combine monster. Like I can probably earn myself a couple million extra if I, if I, you know, participate here. But yeah, I mean, it's, I think you could see less and less people participating for sure. I, I, I almost what... had like the the opposite take of it this year in that you saw neighbors and Harrison, the consensus top two sit this out. Um, and then from a sentiment factor, just hearing people talk and seeing some updated mock drafts after the combine, like some people had Odunze going ahead of neighbors in some mock drafts. Like there was very bullish sentiment. You know, Odunze pulled uh, all the right heartstrings, staying out on the field to keep doing his drills. Oh and, like, my God, you know. right? <laughs> but like to Did me, you know, I boy. wonder... If, if you're, you know, Harrison and neighbors, they're, they probably feel completely fine. But mm -hmm. watching all of these other wide receivers make waves, do you think there's a small part of their camp that's like, I wonder if these teams is just like, hey, we'll just trade back, get another asset and scoop one of these guys up at 15, you know, or whatever. Like, this class is so deep. Do we need to spend a top four pick, a top five pick on one of these guys? That would be like the galaxy brain, you know, contrarian take on not going and then Every literally everyone other than Troy Franklin just showing out at the combine <laughs> at your position. Yeah, your boy, RIP. <laughs> Poor thing. Um, yeah, should we? Uh, it, any other any other combine takes? I mean, my only other I've seen like some pushback with all the like double counting and stuff. I I've been writing up a piece for Fantasy Life this week at like the biggest risers that I've seen. Obviously, like Xavier Worthy, the Texas guys, um, Jalen Wright, Benson. And I'm looking at, you know, where, okay, last year, every single rookie wide receiver who went in round one, Quentin Johnston, Jordan Addison, Zay Flowers, and JSN, all what had a top 85 ADP by BBM close, right? Yeah. Like, you're like, I feel like Xavier Worthy, AD Mitchell, I think these guys are pretty sure locks to be round one picks. 
and they're going outside of pick 100 right now. They're going at pick 120. Mm. Like I think yeah. they are absolute locks by when BBM closes to be going 30, 40 this year, maybe 50 picks earlier. I, I th- I'm kind of shocked. I thought rookie fever on underdog. I thought that's what underdog drafters do. They chase up the sexy new things. And I'm sitting here, I'm refreshing the ADP. I'm like, when's this going to go up? Every time I'm in my draft at pick 100, Xavier Worthy still on the board. I act, my take is underreacting to the combine right now. And not underreacting to what they did specifically, but underreacting to what NFL evaluators and organizations are going to react to the combine. This might be a case study in us being so, so tethered to ADP that we're scared to be the first movers. 100%. That is yeah. so. That is so true. I. I mean, I feel it all the time, and 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 all the sports where like the, I've got a position. You know, I'm I'm on the board, and there's a player that I want to take, but like it's 20 picks ahead of ADP or something like that. And yeah, like it, you feel, you feel compelled to stay within the ADP boundaries. But yeah, no, you're you're right, Pete. I didn't like realize that we still have Troy Franklin at pick 95 going ahead of a lot of good real NFL wide receivers and rookies that like had fantastic combines. So that's like really fascinating to see. Not to mention like you go look at Dane Brugler's latest mock draft. Even I I would take the over on AD Mitchell and Xavier Worthy going where he has him. He has Xavier Worthy going to the chiefs with one of the last picks. He has AD Mitchell going to the bills. You're telling me if Xavier Worthy goes to the chiefs and AD Mitchell goes to the bills that you're going to be able to get him at pick one twenty. No, those guys are going to be in the fucking 50s. <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah, great show. Crazy. <laughs> yeah. I, I, for better or worse, man, uh, t- uh, Tank Dell just like completely shifted like how we're going to think about wide receivers. And I don't know if that's like necessarily correct. Uh, I wish I had like the numbers in front of me of like what he did for a wide receiver of his size, but it was like unprecedented. And that was the whole reason why I like didn't, I wasn't in on him because I was like, oh, well, he's just like too tiny to, to be successful. And now there's a whole there's a whole crop of tiny dudes coming into the to the league ready to just like take take over by storm. I think it's time to readjust, or at least you know, talking to myself here, readjust some priors on 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 the size of guys. It, yeah, and it's interesting. Like, think about it. I mean, at like a Dunze, and I'm not saying he should move up because he was already going pretty high, but like his ADP is barely budged. Uh, Brian Thomas's hasn't budged that much because he was already at a frothy thing. But I do think like these guys that like surprised at the combine, like even looking at Trey Benson, like I was writing him up and looking at his ADP right now. And I'm like the floor scenario for Trey Benson, like let's assume he squeezes into the back half of round two as like a bad case scenario. It's like you land in a Zach Charbonnet spot. That's the worst case scenario. There's a really good incumbent who isn't going to go away. And at that case, you still have massive contingent value as a talented handcuff RB. And are we all willing to pay 10th, 11th, 12th round picks for that kind of profile? Yes. That's like the worst case scenario. The best case scenario Mm -hmm. is you bank a Damian Pierce rookie year, separate what he did last year, but rookie year landing spot where you have a clear runway and you're a sixth and seventh round pick. Um, So like, I don't know, man, I, I found myself, I thought I was going to be the one being like, Oh, let's pump the brakes. And I'm looking at (laughs) the prices in the projected draft capital. I'm like, these guys are are not screaming up fat draft boards fast enough. Yeah, it's going to be crazy to uh, juxtapose the big board ADP at close. Well, you could do open, close, and then open of BBM. And you'll see instantly like closing line value in quotations of like 30, 40 spots, as you guys are alluding to. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question you came up with, Nez, there, because I, I was going to bring up something similar because I was really curious what you guys would say. I saw a tweet. I don't know who to attribute it to it was not someone famous so i like to give those those little those little accounts credit but something to the same effect of like there's a, a lot of people that are going to misevaluate their process over the next couple of years because of the outliers that we saw last year in um Kyron williams and tank dell like just in terms of like over the last two years because like yeah i don't know and i, I was very curious i was how, glad you brought it up because i was thinking how so would much. you I guess I just view those things, I guess the processes that would get you on those guys would be like so apples to oranges, right? Like uh, Tank Dell as for, a For rookie. those two in one in one like yeah. comparison? Agreed. Agreed. Right. I yeah. don't think they're the same in, in, in how you land on both of those guys. Well, um, I, 
I, I think it's because like one was the size thing with the the wide receiver thing, and then the running back one being like a non athletic profile. And traditionally speaking, we'd always been like super in on athletic profile from running back. I mean, sort of. No, Landing that's that's not always, wrong. You know, what yeah, I mean? mm-hmm. yeah, that's not wrong. I think the. Yeah, like out of the draft, right? I, I think that that's like a fair thing to say about Kyron Williams, that he's not jumping off the page as somebody that like has league winning upside. It was obviously it was the offseason that he had that was like really highly signaling like, hey, this guy is like they like this guy and they really want to like they want to preserve him and they want him to be a part of the offense. And then Tank Dell, I mean, Tank Dell had awesome tape and like, you know, really strong skill set. But it was, for, it was just like he weighs 150 pounds. So like, what are we doing? And th- I think there is a, a case to make that like, like as these wide receivers just prioritize speed more and the way that the rules are set up, like you can be that size and have success. I think the Kyron thing is, is fun for fantasy football, John. It's like when the, the fish like hits their like gut shot straight draw and then wants to play the rest of the night, because like yeah. this was the ultimate grinding information play like the people who were hawking what was happening with the depth chart understanding what was going on cam Akers falling out of favor them not liking the rookie enough to trust him sean McVay was actually pretty transparent with a lot of his quotes um throughout the preseason and how he felt about it and if you were just slurping up that news you were firmly on kyron as the clear running back to in a premium handcuff heading into the season. Like, I love that that exists, that it wasn't just another. Yeah. It had to be the talented guy who had the profile to do it. Like that was a win for the news grinders. And I feel like (laughs) in this day and age, we don't get that many of those. No, that's yeah. That's a really good point. That's a, to to bring it full, full uh, circle there. That's, that's the, the Billy effect of the modern era. Mm -hmm. For sure. (laughs) Should we draft fellas? Um, Yeah, let's draft. I want to ask you guys a, uh, you guys want me to draft? I can draft. Going to be our driver. I, I got. Oh, we might have ended up in the same draft. No, I didn't click anything. Are you? In oh no, no, already? okay. I just, I just regged. Okay. All right, let's go. All right, you snap build influencer one hundred and one, fellas. <laughs> let's go. Let's go. We're back. I think the Kyron play too. Just like real quick, just because oh I, I wanted to. Kidding. <laughs> no, of course he's not. Uh, the th- the thing about the the Kyron success too is like you can compare Kyron success to like you know let, let's just use Najee Harris let's just use Najee Harris where he has the the physical tools and the 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 college uh, success and didn't quite translate as well as like we had hoped like I wouldn't consider like Najee Harris like a very like awesome runner. He had some decent runs and he had a decent end of the season and he's a fine pick where he goes. But I I can't help but think of like Blake Corum as somebody that can be, you know, like an like Austin Eckler is obviously like a a 101 in the weight room. But on the football field, isn't like a spectacular specimen necessarily. He just is kind of good at what he does. I kind of put Kyron in that comp camp, and I think I, you could put Corum in there too. Just like from what I've read and what I've seen here. Uh, sorry, we can go ahead and uh, make this really any, difficult pick. Is anyone not CMC? I, I'm sure John always has a Galbraith thought off his sleeve. <laughs> let's flip the board. Let's get Bijan at the front end. Nobody's doing it. <laughs> Uh, no, I like it. I like that thought there, Nez. I, I wanted to ask, there was one more in the chat here, because I think there's two really polarizing prospects that I wanted to talk about still. That, the um, uh, Coleman and uh, Jalen Wright were two from the weekend that were, one was a winner, one was a loser in quotations or whatever. And I don't I don't know. I think there's like some, some holes to, to poke in those ones, but Someone said in the chat that uh, Wright was going to be like um, Paul said in here uh, that it was going to be like one of the biggest closing line value uh, there. Do you guys have any any takes that'll make us look stupid in a couple months? I, I will say I did write up Jalen Wright uh, his ADP in the past. I think it was like ten days. He was from one ninety to one fifty nine, and I don't think we're done seeing his uh, his movement there. But on the um, I do think it's interesting to think about the fallers, right? And if our thesis is these guys are moving up too slow, I think we could probably have the inverse take that the guys who had a poor combine are moving down too slow. Maybe the Troy Franklin, the Keon Coleman. 
I wonder, like, if you are just approaching this from drafting a lot of teams, we know what is the contest at right now, only 42% full. Like, you attack those rookie risers now, play the market game, and then wait for everyone to finally get down enough on Keon Coleman, on Troy Franklin, and pack your bags once we get this post-combine fallout settled in the ADP market. Because I don't think we're settled yet. It seems like it's going to take another week or two for it to get there. But then I wonder if that's when you pack your bags on the fallers because in the same vein with all of this stuff, like we don't, we don't fucking know, right? Like we get confident <laughs> in our evaluations, all of this stuff, but like, could Keon Coleman be the stone cold league winner? Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, and if you're going to get a better price on him in two weeks, I think you just play the market there. Yeah. I think that's a good show. The, the, I was watching a little bit of uh right after and that that uh, Tennessee offense is so so strange to mm. watch because he faces like five and six man boxes over and over again because their wide receivers are so spread out and stuff like this. So they're talking about how explosive his run rates are and you know his second half of his speed is like top end, but he never gets touched for like the first six yards and it's just kind of like a a top spinning to to explode kind of thing. It's, it's very, very unique. I, I mean, I'm not a talent evaluator, but it's it'd be a very top uh, evaluation, I think. I love this. John, John saw that he had a faster five-yard split in the 40-yard dash than Devon A. Chan, and he said, I need to go watch the film, pull some, <laughs> pour some cold water on this guy here. <laughs> I kind of, I got that's kind of exactly the process there. Pete. That, was, that was you literally just exposed this morning's uh, breakfast sausage right there. <laughs> breakfast sausage. I will say, John, one thing that can take out, and the only reason I know this because I was writing him up and I was like reading some of the road of his rookie guide. Um, he had 29 broken tackles uh, at Tennessee too, so like that kind of separates to like easy boxes, just showing like what he does do uh, when he's getting uh tackled after contact yardage was at 4.1 which is pretty good um please don't make me take josh allen or barkley at the one two turn or the two three turn but i'll take anyone else now let's, let's do the tank dell the aforementioned tank dell yep i like it who do you guys like uh we got Pittman returning on the tag Diggs is still Diggs. I haven't been liking doing like Laporta just because I think there's other really nice tight end values. Definitely. We did Metcalf last time. We could do another mm -hmm. grown ass man with Evans Waddle. You got one Nez. Uh, I got a strange one because I think we can just hammer yeah. wide receiver after. And what if we just do uh, ETN? Okay. All right. Let's, let's get weird. Talk to me here. This will be a unique uh, two running back build here. Uh, I, I'm, I just like ETN as a player, you know, you talk about just like what you can look at from, from a running back and what they can control. And he, he breaks a lot of tackles and they've got some offensive questions as well, like for better or worse for his out, outlook where like, we don't know what they're going to do with Calvin Ridley, if they are going to like resign him or not. And I don't see him like facing competition other than, you know, maybe this is finally uh tank Bigsby's year, but I, I don't see much going like like that's that's going to stand in ETN's way. I just think there's just so much more meat on the bone for him. Yeah, I think we talked about it a little. Was it last show? Just about how like to me the only concerns with like the Jags in general is just like how the coaches use them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, just I just don't have a lot of confidence in Peterson. I have a lot of confidence in ETN's uh, talent. There was the quote I because I had read uh, Barry's combine nuggets piece and he was relaying stuff from the peterson presser where they were saying yeah we got to get tank bigsby going again and like we don't ever want to <laughs> saddle up etn with too many touches but you do just hope it's one of those situations where it's like rational coaching prevails and you're like hey getting travis etn the ball in space is like one of our best ways to win and move the ball um so i'm always down to bet on talent with you but it is like peterson does spook me Especially when he has a history of doing that, right? Like he did that for so long with the Eagles. Anything like else you guys want to like like drop on on this on this pick <laughs> that, that I just made? <laughs> oh, no, I, okay, I, I got a question. I got a question. I got a question. Do I, I was looking at that Allen Diggs stack staring us in the face, and like how it was like a luxury to obtain last year, and we just kind of like sloughed it off and and didn't even care for it right there and it's i don't think it's hard to get right now but it's like it's probably harder to get 
with CMC because someone usually grabs one of the two before it falls there. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Did we did we turn our nose up at that too quickly, or is that Diggs scares the hell out of me? Yeah, me fair too. enough. Yeah, I'm very very I scared think... about stuff on Diggs. I think everyone kind of thinks that. Oh, go ahead. No, I think everybody kind of thinks they're going wide receiver in the second round anyways, right? Like that's kind of like the sentiment is like they don't bring back Gabe and and they they kind of not replace Diggs, but they replace some of the lost production. Yeah, and if you think about like Gabe Davis had nothing to do with uh, Stefan Diggs' target share, you know, dwindling last year, right? It wasn't like Gabe Davis emerged as a 25%, you know, target hog. Um, Khalil Shakur, if anything, got maybe thrusted into too big of a role. I think if you think Diggs naturally fell off, and this was like without Kincaid coming on necessarily in a massive way, everyone expects him, if you look at his ADP, to take a leap this year. Then you have uh, them most likely drafting some kind of wide receiver in this class to fill him. It's just like the attack vectors are increasing for Diggs, and he had a really clear runway last year with not a lot of competition for targets. And whether because of his skill level or the way the offense was funneled, like he was just not getting treated like an alpha wide receiver who the offense ran through. And I think that's kind of scary at these prices still. Yeah, that's a pretty good shout about the not the offense not funneling through him in the same regard as other wide receivers because we did see a pretty clear switch. And that's kind of why we liked um, James Cook so many times at the tail end of the season there when Joe Brady took over was like they were the, the, the run pass split skewed so heavy to the run side late in the season the um yeah i'll go ahead Niz. no i was just gonna say i was shocked i was talking about getting like uh rookie wide receivers i didn't realize neighbors was gonna go like three picks after the uh the etn pick there um i like i like addison a lot here i'm uh i'm also open if you just want a quarterback i i think i'm just i just want to bet on talent right okay. now um i like addison i'm cool with that i don't know for new me the um i guess i'm like indifferent on reaching for stroud just if we want to close the loop on the tank uh stack or if you guys like reed uh or say like a kirk or you got anything andrews would be fine i'd say andrews or shroud that'd be my vote nez you want to break that tie I like both uh, Andrews is fine. Yeah. The one thing, Nez, I was going to say, I know we were like nitpicking holes in the ETN that, pick, just like, yeah, no, know. I'll just, joking. no, no, no. But I was going to say structurally, just from the drafts I've done, I feel like I've been, uh, playing a little too fast and loose with like running back two, three or getting really weak depth in my running back rooms, taking a lot of running back rookie flyers who might not even get drafted or be like number three on a depth chart where I do think if you can navigate and take advantage of all of the mid round wide receiver rookie value right now and kind of pull a double anchor RB where now we, it really doesn't matter. We can end up with five total running backs and like three pretty big flyers at the position to round this out. And we're like completely fine with these two. Yeah, yeah that, that's how I that's how I kind of think about this is like us and people watching this are like really dialed in and they have a good idea of like most players. But I think it's specifically wide receivers being able to identify really strong wide receiver plays where if you just do a, go a little bit out of your comfort zone and like sure up that ru ru that running back too, you can still crank yellow like up and down this draft board and do it well is just the way I kind of think of, about it is just like sure up the the running back too and we'll t we'll take those flyers and and draft w like these these run these wide receivers late that we know are going to move up and that we have a pretty good idea are good value picks. Uh, yeah. Can we uh talk about the Addison one for a sec? Yeah. I'm super curious what you guys think about the quarterback situation for the Vikings there. Um some rumors this this morning, Florio talking about some Atlanta ties and whatever, and then and Kyle Pitts Kyle laughed Pitts it off. Laughed, <laughs> yeah, Kyle Pitts laughing that stuff off in in some tweet stuff, but you know, smoke fire with some Atlanta slash cousins talk when we were we were kind of all in the camp that we thought Fields would kind of go there, but 
just moving pieces for Minnesota. They proved to be productive with the likes of Nick Mullins and Joshua Dobbs last year. So maybe it just doesn't matter betting on talent there. But, uh, you know, if they end up with like JJ McCarthy or something like that, like, which is a lot of people being mocking him there right now, you know, will we see a fall in Jefferson and Addison? I don't know if you'll see one in Jefferson. I mean, Jefferson's, I think, pretty like locked and loaded top four. Uh, you can really do whatever you want in, in that range, in my opinion. Um, but Addison could maybe fall. Like, I I don't know, though. I think there's a pretty, like, clear-cut difference between him and Jaden Reed. Pers- like, I love Jaden Reed. Love what the Packers did. This just I, – I, I just can't help but think this is just still a little too premium of a price for someone like Reed. But okay. you mentioned it, though. Like, Addison – I mean, we know Jefferson is, is an all-pro, like, top two wide receiver in the league but Addison as a rookie with those other quarterbacks still had like really awesome ceiling games where I think we can feel comfortable about his skill uh, as a player and no matter what they do at quarterback there uh, you know this isn't this is like you know the bars on the floor but it'll at least be better than than what the Steelers are going to opt to do so (laughs) (laughs) okay what can, can I can I ask you guys let's 2v2 it Let's say Rome goes at six to the Giants and you have Rome because Rome went like three or four picks after. Would you rather have Rome with Danny Dimes or Addison with J.J. McCarthy or insert journeyman backup that they bring in at league minimum like Tannehill or Russ Wilson? I don't know if I'm just tied to this investment that we already made, but I would say Addison. Yeah, Addison. Okay, cool. I think yeah. I think I mean, Addison's really, really good, and I think you have a lot of outs to being right. Like, yes, maybe you get maybe Kirk resigns, um, and the offense is good. Maybe they do get a JJ McCarthy type in the draft, and he doesn't pick up that far behind where Kirk leaves off with the offense. Maybe Jefferson gets hurt again, and Addison is the alpha. You know, Hawkinson, his return is pretty murky. Maybe there are just more immediate targets available for Addison early. So. I think you have a lot of outs. I will definitely revise that as we find more stuff. Did we get CJ to come all the way back? Boom. There we go. Oh, all right. Beautiful. Um, yeah. Surgical. Well, um, what pick number is 75? 70? We're at 70. We're at 72. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, this is just like nothing but green. Yeah, I mean, we no this Andy this Mitchell um, too soon. Well, I was gonna say yeah, if we wanted to do that next round, I mean, hmm, yeah, I mean, this might be a spot where we just either if we have a running back, do we like like do you guys really like one of these running backs? Because we could just really go hyper fragile. Um, but there is I like Montgomery. I don't really like him, but like I like Montgomery. I think that he's pretty clearly the goal line back. I don't see that changing they've got them under contract still let's um let's do let's do a running back and we'll be almost funneled to like a true almost hyper fragile build where we're just going to be taking so many year I one think and we year can, two wide receivers i think we can double tap i mean we're going to double tap quadruple tap maybe you know six tap uh wide receiver after this but i think there's going to be wide receivers that we can we can be excited about yeah uh, so, this is so funny, man. Every, <laughs> I love you, seeing did, the dis, the disdain from the comments when you do when you don't just piss yellow. Like people literally get mad. <laughs> did you see my video yesterday? Where it's like you, I, I went five rounds without taking a rookie, uh, and you would have thought yeah. I committed a crime. Some someone <laughs> on YouTube like commented. Uh, I didn't even recognize who the person was, but they're all captured like, since when is Lamar fucking old, bro? I was like, I'm not <laughs> saying he's old. That's the sentiment <laughs> when you don't draft a rookie. Should have taken Drake May there, bud. Ooh, all <laughs> caps is coming for your head. Uh, Yo, I want to say what up to Chad. We hadn't seen Chad in the chat in a minute. We were talking about it yesterday, Chad, but uh, good to see you, bro. Also, shout out to Chad, and this is pertinent to around here. So I'm very close to wrapping up uh, a strategy video that's going to go on the Deposit Kingdom channel it is of course about scrolling the f down did uh an interview with your uh humble badge bros here a couple clips from those guys 
talking about it initially through the daily lens, but then applying it to how can we think about it through um, the lens of these season long best ball drafts, specifically, I think best ball mania, the bigger contest, but I thought of Chad as well, because I took some of his data that he had aggregated for just on average, what ADPs translated to in the dailies, as far as uh, draft percentage. And I, I turned it into a nice little graph uh, graphic. So we will get that included. We got the hat tip to Chad. I appreciate him uh, doing that, all of that legwork early on in the year last year to help get us that data. Love it. That's, That's going to be a fun one, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, yeah. I hope it, I think it should spur some interesting conversation because, you know, like so much of this stuff, I don't think there's necessarily a, a definitive um push the plane uh a definitive <laughs> answer to how to think about it definitely lots of theories and uh you know obviously we have bricks theory i talked to sacrilegious a little talked to leone a little like getting some thoughts in there so hopefully we can kind of launch a discussion if your guys is uh scroll the f down can in fact be the 2024 season long drafting meta that's that's a that's gonna be a tough one for us to swallow if it's not the new meta Nes. I mean, I we've staked we've staked our reputation out there. We put our necks on the line here. <laughs> I've been doing it a lot. I mean, I know this is like a different sport, but I think you can't translate. It. Doing a lot in, in the baseball streets, where I've been scrolling down, starting at rounds like fifteen, taking guys that are traditionally twentieth round picks and taking them at fifteen, then taking another twentieth round and another and another twentieth round, and that's because these are profiles and players that I like. But that I think that will absolutely be a thing that, like you know hopefully that people talk about more in BBM because it, it, it seems really smart. Yeah. And I think one of the points you made up that, you know, I highlight in the video too, and I won't, I won't spoil too much of it too, is like the ways you can create uniqueness on the back end of your roster um, aren't limited to just scrolling off the page, you know, so to speak, <laughs> that there's other ways you can kind of ignore ADP, but maybe in a less reckless way. Yeah, we we talk about that a lot with NBA on a night to night basis, Pete. Where there's like there's certain dudes who just fall in the same pockets every single night. A K A K Rosen, where you know he's never going to be in the first two rounds, but he's never going to make it to the fifth or sixth, right? And he just always falls in this clean little like four pick pocket. So like what you can do with him in the middle rounds could flip the board for the entirety of the night kind of thing. Let's do it. Texas so, forever. I, I just put the Texas boys in the queue. Uh, again, when you're picking at the turn, you're not getting any deal on these, but I really do think we're still going to get CLV on these clicks here. Do you, do you guys like it? I yeah. don't, I think if we don't take these two players that are, are the viewership will either like crash or we will get death threats like into our DMs. So I think we better hurry up yeah. and take these rookie wide receivers before we just destroy your brand, Pete. In 2024, horns, baby. in 2024, things escalated so much on underdog fantasy that streamers were receiving death threats for not drafting <laughs> enough rookies, prompting the bad pros and Pete Overzet to double tap two Texas wide receivers at the 8-9 turn. <laughs> More on this. Can, can we talk about the worthy one for a second, though? Like, do Yes. We too much into like a one one hundredth of a second here in terms of like I, like like ad mitchell to me seems like there was a flipping last year and i ended up watching like a decent amount of texas and then obviously watched them versus the huskies and that sort of stuff uh in the playoff and it, it, it just seemed like he was your like prototypical alpha x in that offense like this year and you know the dominator rating and breakout years for Xavier Worthy were like earlier. And then last year, it's like, oh, we got this new guy who's going to score all the touchdowns. <laughs> let's uh, let's flip him there. And now all of a sudden, Worthy gets thrust up to be on his same level uh, in like the scouting eyes because he ran. I, I don't know. I just I get like these weird like John Ross, Henry Ruggs, like these kind of vibes where it's like. We just move these guys because of like a hundredth of a second. It's funny. I have more concerns about 80 Mitchell getting overdrafted Ooh. from his combine than worthy. Okay. I mean, worthy was really good. So as a freshman, 
39% dominator rating, 981 yards and 12 TDs as a, as a freshman. Yeah. Like, and he was really good on special teams too. Right. Which Rotoviz has a lot of data on that over the years. Like even back to like when Tyler Lockett came in the league, like those guys who had um, returning experience, like really boosted the predictability of them uh, turning in serviceable fantasy years. But like Xavier is like a total unicorn in that any of these other speedsters who are glorified track stars just didn't never had a season with that kind of dominator rating where they earn targets or let's even just say the team was manufacturing targets with them. And then for the speed thing, I don't know, man, like how many times do you watch Tyree kill or Devon Achan or one of those guys and just be like, they are literally playing at a different speed than everyone else on the field. Like Tyree kill has a gear that like no other wide receiver has. And now we have like, testable proof that Xavier Worthy has that gear. You mentioned uh Jameson Williams in that in that conversation too, right Pete? <laughs> <laughs> who who did I saw a tweet going around where were they comping AD Mitchell to Jameson Williams? That's a I, that's a plus. That's a plus. I need to look that one up. There was like one of those little like looking at the metrics and they were comparing Jameson to one of these guys. I thought it was AD. Yeah. But <laughs> Did John Ross just run bad on injuries? I don't know. Is this you, Doug? Like, I have that. Yeah. I just, I, I caught you. Oh yeah. I, I'm just, I was just looking at, at all the, all the comments, and yeah, I did realize how, how silly our two. We, we took the, uh, yeah, the, the number three, uh, scoring running back in fantasy last season at the two three turn. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, I just, I just want to issue my last and formal apology on that. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> I found the comp. It was actually Troy Franklin to Jamison Williams. Uh, both 6'1", 176 pounds for Franklin, 179 Williams. Very similar arm length. Um, Williams didn't run the 40-yard dash. but Franklin's big knock was the contested catches thing. We we did, yeah. a, we did a breakdown our very first draft with Troy Franklin. Remember that? That's the on-the-fly <laughs> breakdown on our first big board. And we, we just went anecdotal narrative of how he performed uh, one game against UW, but then didn't perform the next. <laughs> this, I, I love Lad we gotta McConkey, talk about baby. I, I love you, Lad. Okay, I don't, but I'm telling you, he goes 20 picks earlier than this in every other draft I do. So this might be my only fucking Lad share. Uh, <laughs> no, but he, he did fine at the Combine. I just think he's like juiced up Hunter Renfro. Which maybe juiced up. Hell yeah, Cooper, baby! Tuka Nakua. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I was listening. I was listening to Josh and Hayden, and they said they were gonna get, that we were gonna get all these lazy uh, white receiver comps for Lad when yeah, he doesn't yeah. play anywhere similar to them. So sorry, <laughs> r- real quick, since we're on the clock here, for me this is Shahid or Dotson. Um, I'm curious what you guys think here. Um, I would probably just lean Shahid. Um. I'm just more confident Shahid is good than jo- than Dotson is. Okay. The Dotson play was like maybe Drake May goes there or something. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, but I, mean, I like Shahid, Wednesday though. There. What's that? No, I, it's all good. I was just saying what was – I was just curious what was available at the onesies, well, not necessarily that we were going to take him. I do think Ladd is really interesting, right? Because he, he, he surprised at the Combine – um but he didn't like he didn't have a huge role uh in college but then when he was like asked upon like he did good i'm pretty sure he had a decent like yards per route run but just like was not a huge part of their offense like their market share which is weird because normally the prototypical like hunter renfro types right like they have pretty gaudy market share numbers because they're like the safety blanket they're the guy that gets open so now you have like this typical slot wide receiver who's more athletic than we're used to, but then was it actually commanding that much of the right. offense in college? I feel like it's a weird profile. Well, I think it's because Bowers just did so much, you know, yeah. like that they, they, they had like a top 10 talent there to just overshadow him that it was like, he's the safety blanket. He's the seam route. He's the red zone, like that sort of stuff as well. It's funny, though, because then people will use the argument on the other side. Like, I've seen a lot of stuff with Brock where it's like, if he doesn't go somewhere where he can't be the focal point of the offense, like, he's going to, you know, crater at this ADP. And so it's like, which which one was it? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I like Lad. What Do you have any other <laughs> notes on, on Lad? 
Uh, I just know that Ned. he had a decent. I, I I just know that his combine was like better than expected. So yeah. for for that reason, I'm in. Uh, and I saw some clips of him running routes, and I think that he can. I think that he can run routes well, which is something that I care about. Yeah. Where did um? I, I was looking at um the the RAS scores this morning. Did you guys see the eighty Mitchell one? It was like the. Did- it was massive. Yeah. 9.98. And it was yeah. the highest. Yeah. The 40 time adjusted for size and stuff like that. Yeah. At what? Like 62, 205, 435. Yeah. Yeah. I think we took him in our very first big board, didn't we, John? Yeah, we did. Damn right, we were man. like, this is the real Texas wide receiver. Yeah. Yeah. Too bad that, too bad that, too bad that big board team has a uh, JK Dobbins on there. <laughs> that's just for moral support man that's uh that's true. it's good card yes i just you got such prob- clv oh sorry Go ahead. oh no i was just gonna trigger nez looking at oh god looking at the road of his guide the the top five profile sims like their comps um lynn bowden riley ridley and then wait for this one deontay johnson for lad <laughs> yeah yeah oh yeah 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 that makes sense it, oh, can, it does kind of make sense yeah, yeah, yeah. God, man, I Deontay is losing his mind. He's his tweets have been out of control. He's he's so like he's just suffering through like bad QB itis. Like that's just like what happens whenever you play with just horrible QB play for four straight years of your prime. Like you just you just kind of you end up tweeting regrettable things. So we need we need to get him get him out out, out of Pittsburgh because I need to see him have a good season. I'm I've been a Deontay truther since his rookie season. Oh, we know. Oh, we know. <laughs> that, that didn't I think, we should, I think we should definitely, you know, keep tossing the chat a, a combine bone with Roman Wilson, who also ripped it up. Any any other uh, takes here? Uh, I'm, I'm cool with him for, for one of these. Sharbs picks. and shut it down. I was going to say it could be shut it down if we go running back. I, I think that I think Sharbs would be fun. Yeah. Go with a, I think go we with all- a stint. Yeah, yeah, I think we all just are sharps guys here. We are. That's gonna I love be like our for him. Yeah, mm-hmm. I I could see this like getting like going up a little bit. You know, it's it's a different comp than um obviously than like the Najee Jalen Warren thing, but like this is like very similar ADPs for both of these guys. And Charbs is is just very very talented, and it, it just as like standalone value, even when. Uh, Ken Walker is healthy. Like I still think Charbs, like he's not going to win leagues. He needs more than that. But in the event that he does have the role to himself, if something happens, then he's. I mean, God, he's he's a, he's a smash based on what we've seen. Yep. Yeah. Yep. There's just. I mean, I. It would be. It would be one thing if we never saw him play last year, right? Like if he was just yeah. on the bench and we're like, I don't know, man, he was still drafted like pretty high. And has, it's like, no, we saw him come in as a bell cow in really tough matchups in produce. What was it back to back against the Cowboys and the Niners where he had basically yeah. bell cow games. Yeah. And they were, they were both on those primetime slates or whatever. And we were drafting them like, yep. crazy. yeah. <laughs> yep. right, yeah. And it's, it's the, the pass catching rule, right? Like, yeah. He displayed that last year, and that's exactly what you want. And then he's got the size and breakaway speed as well. So, and the thing is, is like let's let's compare to because you know where where did Kenneth Walker? So Kenneth Walker is going at pick fifty two, which is pretty comparable to where he was going last year. More like back end around five six, I want to say, like when things settled. And then Charbonnet was like around ten eleven pick, and they I came actually closer. Haven't... They came closer together at the tail end of draft season because we thought Walker wasn't going to be ready with the groin oh, in camp. You're right. I forgot about that. Um, but then, like, we kind of, I guess, saw, like, the median outcome, right? Where it's, like, almost like how the market expected it. Like, Walker's the lead back. Sharbs eats into his pass catching role a little bit and gets one to two spot starts. Like that's almost exactly, I think the market like had it almost perfect from an ADP standpoint, but now we're getting Sharbs two, three rounds cheaper than we were. 
And it's like, aren't we just going into the season with the same thesis and the, we were already kind of acknowledging the market was correct last year? And we expect them to take a offensive uh, leap forward with brand new coaching staff and no more of the establish the ball or establish the run era guys. Yep. Uh, although the quotes coming out have, haven't been uh, haven't been great. Well, some might call him a zero RB target, uh, but when you're drafting <laughs> with the piss boys, he is merely the final piece of a hyper fragile build. <laughs> shut it down baby shut it down no I, I like this and we're gonna we're gonna be happy with how with how the team looks now we've got the world is our oyster at this point we can rid ourselves of of dusty running backs yeah i think really the other kind of the interesting thing is how we attack quarterback you know when you have so many rookies um kind of uncertainty at it, as far as like no other kind of logical stacks to do mm-hmm yeah, I, I struggle with 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 QB at the at this range where I'm just like trying to not take zeros at this point. I think we can be a three quarterback build here, um, pretty much no matter what. Depending on what CFT does here, I mean, I'm fine taking the dip on Rogers at pick 168. That's what I mean. Like, I I would I would do this and just be like, okay, cool. I have a QB too. Like, sure, he's not stacked, but. We could bail out with Conklin. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Especially um, when, we, when we spent on Andrews, right? I mean, if you really want to pander to the crowd, I mean, the other guy everyone loves is Pearsall. He was he's the he was the fifth biggest riser um, from from the combine. I don't know a ton about Pearsall. Sell me that pen. People I just like to crush the combine. Yeah. Yeah, we were I, I like Washington guys before that. Mm, that's true. I think Dude, he might Malik. come back. Okay. I don't yeah, know. I think Pearsall is going to get better draft capital at this point. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. My, the thing that's so funny about this guy is I, in, in like my, where I grew up, like this school that I played against, I played against a kid named Ricky Pearsall at, like, <laughs> really? forever. And it's just like every time I see this guy now, I just think of obviously the Ricky Pearsall that I played basketball against, like from the moment that I can remember playing organized basketball. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I just want to say to the chat who was saying we were drafting all these old dusty guys, how put, put Xavier worthy, 80 Mitchell, Lad McConkey, Roman whistle, uh, will whistle Wilson and Ricky Pearsall <laughs> in your pipe and smoke it. Beautiful. <laughs> the the nameless faces, the nameless faces is the absolute true mystery box to a roster. Yeah. That's how, you know, you're drafting oh. a good team. Yeah, once those headshots come out, that's when you really know if you like did well or not. If they have a good headshot, then you can like feel really confident. Uh, there it is. There's the RAS score. That's good. I also I don't want to cool. let this go by because way way back at the beginning of the show, I think it was uh, when Copper said he wanted to deposit Kingdom Combine. Then he snuck in that he thinks he would be faster than everyone. Ooh. Ooh. I mean that. Uh, I met I met I met Copper at the dog ball and I want to book that. <laughs> yeah, I, I was kind of, I was kind of thinking the same. Like I was like, <laughs> like, you know, he's got he's got a little bit of a tight end frame to him. I don't know if he's been training up. Like, you know, not in a bad way. You know, he's just you know, he's big big upper bodies. <laughs> I mean, he might awesome. be he might be a um, he might be a relative. Uh, athletic scorer you know that he might be like <laughs> aiming for for that score relative to it there you go wide base when 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 is when has anyone ever touted a wide base as being a bonus for the 40 yard time <laughs> <laughs> gets an extra wad a little waddle there across on the the line we got oh man we got to do this we need to set up I, I i'm not doing any bench pressing but we can uh i definitely hit a hit a three cone drill i I, I don't know when it's supposed to happen, but I'm pretty sure um, the the BDGE guys uh, or Colano and Co are doing um, a combine, and I'm pretty sure Underdog's going to put up some lines for it. Oh my god, so, that'd be awesome! So maybe if we we did our own, we could get some. What when is it? Give me give me a month that I'm competing. Give me a month. Oh and god, send me up there. I'm competing. Box you're, lacrosse, you're be... deposit kingdom <laughs> box lacrosse match. There we go. There'd be some blood. Oh yeah. <laughs> 
Did you guys ever play rugby and or watch rugby? I just know um, about scrums. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I have you- watched a little bit of rugby. The Our university's uh, rugby club was, like, pretty decent. Um, so I'd see some of it. But, no, I, I never had any interest in getting my shit kicked in playing rugby. <laughs> There's big rugby culture around here. And they we host the uh, – like, Vancouver hosts the rugby sevens every year. So seven aside instead of like the, the old school scrummy stuff. So it's like way faster. And a guy that I went to high school with and whatever played on the Canadian national team and, you know, what a Canadian lead in scores there. So we'd go out and support them every single year. But those things, man, if anyone lives in a city where sevens come through, it rolls through Vegas, it rolls through, you know, I don't know, like Singapore and Hong Kong and stuff like that. They are a blast. Like it's just match after match there's seven minutes each half so they're like 14 minute matches and they play basically 9 a.m to 9 p.m and they just roll through and you just you know open open ticket and everybody just dresses up like everybody's wearing like bear onesies and alligator (laughs) costumes and whatever and it's just like a big booze party with like fifty thousand people it's it's really fun that does sound fun Um, we do have some quarterbacks falling again. We should also think about a tight end too, because it does dry up a decent bit. We do have the Tonk, uh, Conklin, uh, stack. I think that definitely makes sense. Nice. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, I'm not sure what other tight ends are on the board here for us, but I, the, the only other guy I I've, so one, one option would be to do like a, a Gino and set up a Noah fan, although he might leave. Right. Um, Tucker Craft. It was the other tight end. I I think is pretty interesting. Yeah, the, I do kind of like Craft. The one thing on the Geno one is they released Will Disley, so mm. I think it's more likely that he's going to stay. But anyways, I like the Conklin pick. Do you guys want to? I guess we should re quickly. I'll take Conklin, and then we should think through our QB three situation. I guess if we're fine taking a flyer on like one of these deeper rookies, Penix, Knicks. JJ McCarthy like do we want to just grab our third tight end here am I on an or island with like thinking Russ Wilson's like a pretty good pick yes okay I don't know fully on an island I, I think he's serviceable I don't get excited about it who do you think we should go a quarterback or tight end here let's go with Kraft I like that okay I think mm-hmm. he's a good third tight end me too we can galbrain a, a QB stack too like we could do like McCarthy and Addison or we could do like something like that. Yeah. And I mean, the fun thing about going true hyper fragile with this, with the four, I mean, we're going to go a third QB and then we're going to still have two more slots so we can get to 10 wide receivers um, and just really spray and pray here. Mm-hmm. So what it's all about. We're, we're, we're going back to the BBM two roots. That's right. <laughs> yeah, John, I mean, are you going to, Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. I was gonna. I was gonna carry on with the quarterback conversation. I was. I'm. I'm curious where like the quarterback carousel kind of unwinds and stuff like that. And even if getting ahead of it matters at all. Yeah, I don't know that getting ahead of it is important. Um, just because like I don't know who's gonna get a huge boost necessarily at the at this point. Uh, depending on, I guess as far as like veterans that that can be on the move. Um. But specifically, Russ. Sure, he can like like end up in a bet. Like he he definitely rises if he goes to the Vikings. Like you kind of threw out at the beginning, right? Like that's that's I think that's an obvious like rise spot for him. I just feel like I've se- we've just seen him be not good, and I, I don't know what the, what the hope is I, there. The thing that actually kills me about Russ is he. Last year, let's agree, not the best situation is coach hated him, yada, yada. He had a really high floor in a really low ceiling. Like, you looked at the band of his scoring last year, um, and I don't know how much of it was because he wasn't running quite as much. I mean, they were still taking some deep shots. I mean, the offense wasn't super efficient, but, like, he showed no ceiling. Um, so then to me, if that's, all right, we're not going to get a ceiling from him, then the question is, is he a guaranteed starter? You know, is he going to start 17 games? Because you can live with a high floor at a QB three. Like if you're getting the Derek Carr, hey, you're just going to be a body. You're going to start 
Maybe you give me one spike week at the most beautiful time I need it. But now you bake in him not potentially starting 17 games, and then it starts to become a dicey pick. Or, John, do you think he's closer to a lock to be a starter this year for the whole season? Like, I I kind of floated this on Twitter when I was talking to Sam Sherman about because he threw out a tweet about some potential landing spots and stuff. I think there might be like a resurgence in the meta of like the way we've viewed rookie quarterback over the last couple of years is how we could view veteran minimum quarterback who's been bought out by another team and doesn't care how much money he's making because it's effectively the same thing, but with a veteran. So like, I think Tannehill could be that. I think, you know, Russ could be that. And I think like a team that's on the brink of contending, why wouldn't you rather take that Avenue than like drafting a rookie starter this year? If you think you're like really close to contending, which I think maybe the Vikings still think they are. I think, Maybe the commanders think they low key are, and I think maybe wrongfully that Vegas thinks they are. I don't know. That would kind of be like the three and Atlanta, I guess. Those would be kind of like the three or four. It almost makes you wonder. I kind of agree with you, John. It it, is the best way for Russell Wilson to go about this to go like the lettered Fournette model, which is wait, think about how many teams would have fell over themselves to give Russell Wilson a contract by like week 10 last year, the Jets being one of them. Versus if you go sign right now, limited money, maybe some teams like, yeah, you'd be a perfect backup for us. Like whatever, we'll, we'll do this. But it's almost like you should just wait, have leverage because some team will desperately want him to start for him down the stretch and be their generation's Joe Flacco. That's literally what Blake Snell's doing right now in the MLB. It's such like a beautiful comp. Yeah, the Carson Wentz model, been saying. Like that, that, that makes sense. I, I, gotta, I gotta pick here. Um, and it's very fitting that Bindles just got pulled up on screen, uh, who is one of the biggest Iosovis fans. And I was reading Barry's combine report, you know, uncertainty about if Boyd returns, but he had a nugget in there about like Burrow really liking and trusting Iosovis. All right. Sign um, me up. I thought that we're was two fun. for two. We're two for two on Iosovis, um, exposure on off and on the clock now. So, well, then let's do the, the conversation here. If we are going to take one more quarterback, which I think we should, um, mm-hmm. do you want to do the Russell Wilson or the black box, Michael Penix or Bo Nix? I like, I mean, I know John likes Penix. I don't know if he likes him here. I like Penix, man. I think somebody's going to take right. a shot on him. Take a shot on Penix. This is the only way you get John off a dusty Russell Wilson take is to dangle a Husky in front of him. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah come on, man. Remember the, uh, the, the bowl <laughs> game. Remember the bowl game. That's what I remember. Uh, I mean, like, uh, I was just going to say, I think Russell Wilson, uh, th- there was no bigger tell that the commanders were going to be the biggest pass funnel of all time than Russell Wilson lighting them up for three touchdowns and 300 yards in week two last season. <laughs> Grow up chat. Grow up. I should have never I mean, used the word dangle a big. Uh, <laughs> like, oh, who's gonna, who's gonna start more football games this year? Bonix, Penix, or Russ Wilson? Man, that's a fascinating one. Is the Bo I can't believe like the Bo Nix stuff is I is I, really, I, is I he, think, he Pen- I, think I mean no, people forget that like Bo Nix before he moved to Oregon and was like actually good and stuff was getting like low key first round steam. And then he was bad at Auburn. So then he had to, he had the COVID year. Then he goes to Oregon. Then he plays till he's old kind of thing. Penix, similar path where he had to like switch because of injury and then actually played well and then stayed because they were national championship contenders. But um, I, yeah, think- I don't know. I think. I think I'd put Knicks in like a slight, like I think it's probably close between Russ and Penix. And maybe I would put Knicks below those guys just based on what it seems like for draft capital. Yeah. Do you think Penix goes ahead of Knicks? I think so. I hope so. I kind of think the powers that be want to take Knicks. Really? Yeah, just because of the rushing. Like Penix yeah. is really bad versus pressure and really bad versus the blitz. He's got a nice arm, though. So I think like people, are low key, people are low-key. Like, yeah. Seriously, if he's going to fall to like the second round, 
Yeah. I think that, I think that's the Steelers. Uh, sorry, I don't want to get in the Steeler talk. I, I, I'm going to catch myself before <laughs> before I no just on break. A, on a tangent. I, I didn't. Nez, did you end up seeing my tweet? I don't know if you saw it. I didn't tag you, but I mentioned you in a <laughs> I reply. Did see it. To John. <laughs> Have I seen About, that guy on your Instagram? I did post an O'Neill Cruz. <laughs> no, but like, <laughs> I mean, like a IG while ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, he's he, he's a frequent uh, story poster. Um, so, so the Steelers, like every all the talk is that like through sources is that they are like not going after Justin Fields not going after Russell Wilson. Like they want no business of these free agent quarterbacks. And maybe they see a little bit of writing on the wall of like Penix or Knicks falling into the second round and making that a pick. Cause I swear to God, if this is, they are like dead ass. Like we've got QB, we got one a and one B and pick it in, in Rudolph. Like, you know, we're going to bring Rudolph back. Like, let's go. Uh, I might, I might not watch a game. <laughs> that is the biggest fucking lie I've ever heard in my whole life. <laughs> no, you, you know what it first. is? It's the whole Arthur Smith industrial complex. And let's just assume that he's making every single decision in Pittsburgh. It's a lot funner this way. Um, yes. He wants to win with one hand tied behind his back. He doesn't want to go out and get an impact free agent quarterback. He wants to deal with the worst possible situation his goal is to turn Mason Rudolph into a fucking star. Like that is what gets <laughs> Arthur Smith off. That is what gets his Penix in his pants rock hard is thinking of making it work with Kenny Pickett, and Mason Rudolph. And they oh. want to bring back Allen Robinson. So it's just like a match made in heaven there. You know, he wants it to be by the hands of, of Allen Robinson too, by the sounds of it. All right. Mr. Irrelevant. We got a three, four, nine, three cook in here. We said we were going to land the plane with one more wide receiver uh i will pre-veto alan lazard double stacked with aaron Rodgers. the floor is Thank open you. to the badge bros oh john do you have any good scroll down targets here well uh, why don't we take the bench press leader man why don't we set the standard there's is the bench him? press lead yep texas a how, i love it how many did you say he did i think it was 19 this is 17 or 19. Let me, I, I got, I still have it open here. Uh, oh my, I undersold him. 21 reps. Oh, on the bench 21. Rep. Welcome to the squad. 21 the reps. Squad. And then, and you want to talk size speed combo here? We, uh, I looked up some highlights of them. First couple as a true freshman house calls on special teams. Everybody's going gaga about scoring touchdowns on special teams for Xavier Worthy. How about, what was his name again? <laughs> I already forgot. Ina Smith. I don't know how to how oh, yeah, pronounce yeah. his first name. Ina I don't want to. I don't want to disrespect uh, this this young man this, by saying this is like the so funniest. Off. This is the funniest wide receiver room. Uh, I Dude, think I've seen in a hot minute. Uh, I'm gonna read this team. I think you guys are gonna like our quarterbacks, our running backs, and our tight ends. <laughs> CJ Stroud, Aaron Rodgers, and Michael, don't call him penis, Jr. Tight ends, Mark Andrews, Tyler Conklin, because he was uh, stacked, relax, and Tucker Craft. And our running backs, Christian McCaffrey, the surprisingly controversial Travis Etienne, Jr., Steady Eddie, David Montgomery, and Zach Way, undervalued Charbonnet. But here's where it gets good. There's 10 wide receivers. It's about quantity, not quality. We got a, a couple wide receivers at the top that weigh a combined 300 pounds, Tank Dell and Jordan Addison. And buckle up. You guys wanted us to chase youth? Well, here you go. Xavier Worthy, A.D. Mitchell, Lad McConkey, Roman Wilson, Ricky Pearsall, and I can't say his first name, but he benches a lot. Smith also paired with Rashid Shahid and Andre Ayasovas. Folks, take a come bow. on. <laughs> take a bow. <laughs> I told you we were going to have fun. I told you we were going to have fun. It was fun. I, I had, had to trust the fun. process. I had to trust the <laughs> process. <laughs> How about this? Let's do here. Let's do a, a little thing. So, how many teams have been? <laughs> it's anus. Come on, folks. <laughs> let me let me do a little little math. So, there's been, or no, I don't have to do math. There's been ninety four thousand five hundred and sixty five teams drafted. How many three four ten three builds do you think there have been in this contest so far? Thirty eight. I was gonna say like close to a hundred. You don't think so? You don't think you think 
four four RB hyper fragile is just like, dead. I don't know. I just fucking guess. I wasn't thinking it through. <laughs> Just like lot and things, lot and things. Thirty eight. I don't know. That's what came to mind. I feel like four. I bet there's a lot of people who started with like a CMC round two. Grab a. I just think most people go five or six. Um, even still here because they don't want to take Anus Smith. Um, as their last pick. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, this is pretty good. The Michael Penis to Anus Smith combo. What if that's Jesus what if that's Christ. what if that's the stack you need? Penis to Anus. Yeah, this is, this is when we shut it down. <laughs> Make sure to mark this one as explicit when you upload the audio. <laughs> oh, I, w- I will be. Yes, we will be getting this uploaded. For the audio listeners, we did simulcast this one. If you guys are watching on my YouTube channel, make sure you guys are subscribed to the Badge Bros for more regular underdog drafting content. I have their uh, their YouTube channel linked down below in the description. What else do you guys have uh, in store on the channel or what should people go back to from earlier this week? Did a couple shows earlier, doing a lot of baseball right now. We, we're, we're, we're right now we're like breaking down hoops and then jumping into base to the baseball streets. So uh, we did some baseball drafts there uh, doing the members only stuff uh, in the mornings and sometimes before lock for uh, NBA dailies for underdog as well, if you're not a member, highly recommend joining. Uh, a lot yeah, of what did you guys just hit? 119 members? Did I Hopefully see? Hopefully after today, 118 so far. Yeah, beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, it's awesome, and it really, I mean, that really incentivizes us to want to keep doing the the members only stuff too. It like you know, seeing that number and hopefully it continues to grow, like just really makes me want to be like, well, let's just commit to doing the rankings in the morning and the lock now, and just you know, spiral effect, right? There you guys go. No, that is, it's super, uh, super impressive stuff. And speaking of YouTube membership, if you guys are YouTube members on my channel, the best ball value hounds, you get access to the after dark interview shows. I just booked my guest for this Friday. I'm going to have uh, Tej Seth, uh, Tej analytics, I believe on Twitter, super sharp, uh, up and coming uh, analyst, uh, from uh, Sumner Sports, so excited to talk to him oh, nice. on Saturday night. That should be fun uh, as well. Um, anything else, uh, John, from you guys? Uh, we got paywall tomorrow. We'll be Nez doing ranks, and then I think I might hop on do some baseball. And I've, I, I don't want to keep the people on pins and needles here, but uh, I got I'm on double dog watch, as you guys can see. There's a dog party happening <laughs> behind me, so I can't really go anywhere. A little bit here, so I might hop on and do hoops again uh, at lock here in in a couple hours. So there's that, and then our Friday show, normal uh, normal time slot for that will be either be 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. Eastern, and that'll be hoops plus baseball. Beautiful. My show schedule tomorrow. Lowell's at 1:30. We're having Pat Mayo on. He just recently signed with Underdog yeah. Fantasy. We're gonna. If you want some maybe inside baseball about his decision uh, to leave Redacted and come over to Underdog, I think he's gonna talk about that a bit on the show tomorrow. And then we're gonna get back in the saddle with ship chasing tomorrow night, 8:15. We haven't done a show for a couple of weeks, so it'll probably be a hodgepodge show. But I'm certain we will talk a little post combine stuff, ADP. All of that good stuff. And that also reminds me, shout out. I know Underdog is renewing uh, and upping a lot of their partnership contracts right now. I've been seeing lots of tweets. Uh, our buddy Ron Stewart, I just saw extended. So uh, a very exciting time in the Underdog space. Underdog welcoming and extending all of our friends and family here. Yeah, yeah it's really awesome. love to see it. Um, and thank you to you guys hanging out in the chat, both the badge bros and the P Overzet chat. Everyone get to training for that combine. Copper Prices has fired the first shot. It's time for us all to get to work. So uh, for Nez, for John, I'm Pete. This has been Off and on the Clock. We'll see you guys next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern.